depending on where you are in the world. My name is Brittany and I have the pleasure of joining you today uh, to talk to you a little bit about my experience uh, both running uh, and operating a, a business called Design Thinking Japan. So there's a lot to do with that. We do a lot of work in innovation and design thinking and creating uh, new business opportunities for our Japanese clients. But on top of that, uh, it's been, I've been in Japan on and off since 2005. So I definitely have a, a journey that I'd like to share with you all as well. All right, awesome. So perfect, thank you, Brittany. So we always start the show with a quote from our guest speaker. <laughs> Brittany, do you have a quote? I'm one of these people that I use it as a toolbox. I don't have that kind of like one particular, I have one particular quote, but okay. anything that highlights resilience for me is one of the things that's really important. So sometimes I need like a resilient quote that's equivalent to like an Eminem song that sometimes I need like that mode that I need that kind of resilience. And then other times I need more of like a scented quote, you know, like the Japanese, you know, seven, fall down seven times, get up eight. So anything around resilience and then, you know, have your, depending on who it's from, uh, you know, can help you through the, uh, a particular phase. I love that. So how do you think uh, resilience has helped you in your life? Sure. What, one thing, because I haven't been on this kind of uh, mode of podcast where it's more than one person. All right. I, can I ask anyone who's in a position to turn on their camera, please turn it on. And I know in Japan, they don't love to turn on their cameras. I know our clients aren't camera people. I get it. And if you're like, oh my gosh, I've got into like the Japanese mode of not turning on my camera. That's totally fine. I'm, I, that's totally fine. Cause I think, and how you don't, I think you could just um, record you and I anyway, right? Or do you record everyone? Well, um, we record the people that speak, but. Um... Okay. Well then let's just, just for clarification, if you're okay with being recorded, turn on your camera. If you're not okay with it, so that's totally fine, don't turn it on. Another thing is, if something comes up along the way that you want to talk about, use our chat as kind of like a memo board that you'd like for yourself and we can go and we can check it. So just to make sure that everyone knows how to use it, can you just say well, like what I'm doing now? Like for example, I'm just saying, hi, it's Brittany. So everyone go in the chat and write it. Because for me, a blank chat is the equivalent of a blank white page, right? Where people are like, ooh, I don't want to touch it. So I've already written in it. I've already made the white page imperfect. So anyone else, you, you can free and go ahead and uh, do that as well. Okay. Um, now on that, oh, I have some, some faces that I recognize that's very exciting. So talking about how's resilience helped me in my life. Resilience uh, is the foundation for, for really anything. I know people talk about motivation, people talk about being inspired, um, but that is the first step for me because there's gonna be times in your journey, particularly in Japan, where it's going to be difficult. It's not difficult because people are against you. It's difficult because the situation is new. It's difficult because you haven't done it before, right? And which is totally fine because maybe, you know, you haven't started a business in Japan before. Maybe this is the first time. Maybe this is the first time you're working in a particular industry. So things being hard don't necessarily mean they're not achievable. It just means that if you haven't done it before, right? So the more that we do it, the better it gets. So for me, uh, resilience is really that driver behind the, that, those motivations, all those dreams that I have that I want to see come true in the world, for me, they, they don't come true without resilience. I see, I see, that's perfect. Resilience, you know, to be strong in the face of adversity, how does that help you as a person? Like if you have a difficulty, you face it, it's difficult, definitely, but does it make you better? Does it make you stronger? Like, what do you think? Well, this is a really interesting and it's kind of where almost my work begins to come in, which is that you understand that the problem and the person are different. So the fact that you haven't been able to set up a business or the fact that you uh, haven't been able to sell a particular product or things like that actually doesn't have anything to do with you. So what we need to do is go and take a very almost... Uh, an equally balanced logical view. So being, okay, what's going on? Let's get into the facts with an empathetic view, which means, okay, empathy is the idea that it's not necessarily sympathy. Sympathy, the difference between sympathy and empathy is kind of like, you know, if someone says, 
oh, I lost my job. And you go, oh, I'm so sorry for you, right? That's sympathy. You're like, it doesn't make you feel good. Empathy is, oh my God, that's terrible. That's happened to me before. If there's anything I can do, let me know, right? So the difference between empathy and sympathy is someone is someone's kind of looking down on you. And the other one is, I know what I've had that before, you know? So what we try to do in both design thinking and also in the idea of, of, of resilience is we separate the problem into facts and then also people. So we can, you can really start working with it. I think people get caught up, particularly in Japan, where you think the reason you're not succeeding is because of you as a person. I'm not doing this, they're not accepting me, right? Whereas really, um, and, uh, and many people on the call can vouch for this, it's really, maybe you're missing a step in your process. Maybe you lodged the wrong form. Maybe, you know, so things like that. So resilience enables me to see uh, the problem and me as a person separately, and right? And so when you do that, it gives you a little bit more motivation to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. I love it. So you, you were talking about logic mm -hmm. and then looking at people in an empathetic way. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that, you know, having that logical part of yourself while solving a problem, while at the same time, you know, thinking about other people how do you balance that sure so there's many there's there's a whole bunch of ways but maybe we can even start talking about our um you know one of the things that we mentioned while we were advertising the talk which is about having divergent and convergent conversations mm -hmm. so everyone can you in your zoom uh button there's like a clap right and then there's also a thumbs up so I'm gonna give you the option, you can use either one, and I'm gonna pose a question to you. So the question is, has anyone been in a meeting uh, where you've had an idea, right? And your boss or your colleague has said, oh no, it's not gonna work. And you go, okay, what about this idea? And they go, no, we've done it before, and you know, that's not gonna work either. Okay, what about this idea? No, we've tried that and it's also not gonna work. Has anyone had this experience? Can you give me a thumbs up or a clap? You get to choose if you want a thumbs up or if you want a clap, okay. So we've had a few people with that same experience. Now I also wanna talk about, imagine we've got at one hour, right? We've got one hour to make a decision and we've spent 55 minutes discussing, 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 and then finally we make a call and has like finally, like we're finally wrapping up this meeting. And then I put up my hand and I go, actually, Anho, can we please go back to the beginning? I've got a new idea. And you look at your watch and it's 9 p.m. at night already and you're going, you're joking. This has got to be a joke. Has anyone had this experience as well? Put your hand up, clap, or give me a thumbs up. Okay, so we've got a few claps and we've got a few thumbs up as well. One of the reasons these exist, both of these conversations are important. And they're called divergent conversations and convergent conversations. So a divergent conversation is when we're trying to understand, right? This comes down to the point or it comes to and has question of, this is where we're trying to understand the person. This is where we want to bring the humanity. This is where we want to bring the empathy to the conversation. We want to understand what's the pain of this person and how we can improve their lives. This is so important. But then there's a time that we need to draw a line in the sand and we need to say, Okay, now we need to use our, our convergent mind, which is, can we afford it? How many people do we need? What's our timeline? What are the deliverables? And so this way, we are able to split a very kind of complex layered conversation of what's difficult, what's hard, what's human, what's logic, what's finance, all these things. We're able to not only effectively run a conversation in a timely fashion because then you're able to make decisions in an hour in a day rather than these kind of six month long as we all know and i'm sure i'll get a thumbs up for this as well these six month long decision making processes that we all know in japan right or even longer you know so this enables us to to be able to not only have a conversation in a timely fashion like a little bit faster but it also enables us to have an equally balanced view of what's the empathy in the conversation, what's the human side, and then also, you know, that other very important issue, which is all those convergent conversations, which is, you know, finance, what about logistics, what about government regulation, so all those things. All right. So should we, so when we have a project, should we start with the human element 
or should we start with the logical element? Where should okay. we start? So um, there's, depending on, you know, the situation, things like this, but let, let me kind of pose this question to you. If I say to you, okay, um, Angel, I have an, here's your solution. The solution is six months. You go, for what? For, for what, six months, what, you know? And so the idea behind it is that we begin not with the solution, but we begin with the person. And actually there's also a business case behind this as well. The business case is that, and because often people, you know, we talk about design thinking, we talk about empathy and people say, yeah, but I'm not here to just simply, you know, make the lives of my customers, you know, this kind of rainbow show, like we have to make money as well. And this is very true. And if you are in the business of, you know, obviously also making money and serving your clients, I would recommend beginning with the, with the person or, or I begin, begin with the problem. And there's a reason for that. It's we, the better that we understand the person, the more likely or the, or the more robust solution that we can create. Another reason is that uh, technology is constantly changing, constantly changing. But the thing that doesn't change as fast are, you know, it's human beings, like our need for connection. You know, for example, if we think about 2019 and 2020, 2019 was the mode, was the moment for co-working spaces. Co-working spaces everywhere. Why? Because we need connection. Human needs connection. So we saw particularly, you know, in places like inner Tokyo, uh, lots of, you know, co-working places, you know, going up. And, you know, I think this was even your first episode, right, with the Hive. You know, some really great, some really great co-working spaces went up. What happens? 2020, there's a global pandemic. No one can leave their house. Okay, so what do we do? We now have this opportunity where we meet now on Zoom. So humans are much, are much more likely to stick to those deep kind of human topics. Like we want to feel connected. We want to feel understood, you know, all these kinds of things. But technology changes. So if we take the view of let's find a way or let's commit to helping people stay connected, your business is more sustainable rather than we build co-working spaces, you know, things like that. So we, we believe uh, for those reasons um, that it makes business sense and it makes human sense to begin with a person in mind. All right. Brittany, let me ask you something. So I guess for us, it's, it's quite easy to, know, to like get lost you know, when we have a business or a job, we focus so much on the numbers and the results that sometimes we forget to, to see our clients, our customers, audience as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we develop that empathy? Like mm -hmm. not that, oh yeah, he's my client, but like really like care for that person as a human and provide mm -hmm. that value. Like, do you have, do you have any advice for that? Sure. One thing is, um, and this is just a, like a very simple and sometimes overlooked technique, is to make time for it, to schedule it. So sometimes, you know, we'll begin a project or imagine this. Let's imagine that we're all going on a journey um, and we take, you know, we have a map and on the map, it tells us turn left here, go right here, go straight. And this helps us get to our destination. If we don't take empathy if we don't take the human side of business um with the same logistics as we do the other side then it gets lost right the reason why we're able to balance our books at the end of the financial year is because we've made time to look at our to you know to look at our accounts to look at our invoices and say okay are you know are we balanced are we not are we making money or are we not and i think to think that we just naturally um, can, can be human and naturally curious. That's true for some people, sure. But let's not forget that the whole time that, you know, we, we kind of grew up in the corporate world or that, you know, our education has been very much focused on that um, shorter term, like deliverables, you know, you know, achieve it, you know, and we see that very often also um, in right. the global markets as well so I would do something as simple as when we begin a project and you begin with the problem statement which is okay 
uh, who's the person and what are we trying to solve here? I would just take it as simply as let's take some time to do, to do that. So that's if you're doing a project. But if you just want to find a little bit more empathy in your, in your work, you're writing your next email, the number one question that I ask myself, and I'm sure we've all had that, that sometimes, has anyone got an email that you're like, you didn't write this email for me, you wrote this email for you. This email isn't to give me information, this email is to make you look smart and it doesn't make me feel good, right? Has anyone ever received an email like that? You know, and so it's little things like that. It's the idea that just if you're sitting down and you're, you're writing your next email, think, am I replying to this person for them or for me? Right? And so when we, start, when we start operating, start thinking a little bit and creating these kind of almost flag posts along the way mm -hmm. to remind ourselves, it's the same reason. We have a natural flag, you know, we have a natural flag in our body, which is if we're hungry, we get this feeling, right? So what we need to do is if, we, you know, with our businesses, we need to create those kind of artificial flag poles. And then once you get used to it, you kind of like develop this idea and it almost becomes routine the same way that you look at your watch and you're like 12 30 i'm probably hungry you know what i mean so things like that so i would just do something as simple as just making time for it and just being aware about it all right all right wow i love that i love that so much and uh i think a question that i want to ask you is do you have a concrete example of a company that's successful because they implement this empathy towards mm -hmm. their customers. Mm -hmm. Sure, so there's, there's a whole myriad of, of examples, but I can give you examples of the last probably three years that's driven, driven my business in Japan. So mm -hmm. I work with larger consulting companies in Japan. Mm -hmm. And for a very long time, uh, Japanese consulting companies would go in to a client and say, here's the solution. And the client would say, well, that's not really our problem, you know what I mean? Or, um, you know, and it's even this idea that you have clients or, or you'd have a situation where people would come in and they would use kind of the same recycled solutions and the clients would know, you, you, you use this with the other guys down the street like six months ago, I don't, this isn't us, you know? And so what was missing is this idea of you, you've heard me, you've listened to me. And the, one of the, this or the concrete example from this particular consulting company is when you develop a, a skill set and that's what it is some people see um the design thinking or innovative ideas as kind of some people have it and some people don't right so this is the equivalent of saying you know i want to be an nba player and you're sitting on a couch and you're eating food all day. Yeah, okay, of course there's some level of talent required, you know, in order for you to be able to be an NBA player. But at the same time, if you're not doing your part, which is go work out, go train, go find, you know, this kind of stuff, if you're not doing your part, then it's gonna fall apart as well, right? So what we do is we go in and we say, okay, client, what's going on, tell us what your problems are. And then after listening to their problems, they go and then deliver a solution. Two things happen here, number one. The number one thing is the client feels like this is a tailored solution. And things in Japan, the, we all know, the more tailored they are, the more special they are, the more limited edition, made in Japan, Sakura version, whatever it is, the more tailored it is, the more likely it is to, to kind of take to kind of like uh, become popular for people to, to adopt it, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is, is, and this for me is the underlying almost more important element of it all, which is when you begin working in a, co in a collaborative manner, right? So you come in and you say, let me hear what your pain is. Let me hear what your business pain is. And then let's us with our skill set or with our network of people, let's solve your problem. When you develop that kind of relationship, it becomes, it, people start developing those human connections. And so instead of looking at pricing and instead of going to the next consultancy for whatever reason, people work with you because they want to work with you, right? And this is so important, particularly in tough times, like times of Corona, where Japanese companies are looking at their budgets and, you know, the, the beginning of the financial year had promised certain money to some departments, but they're based on forecasts, you know, that are now inaccurate. 
you know, so we're looking to kind of this kind of, you know, cost to suck again, you know, like cost reduction, cost reduction, you know, where what we're trying to do is find ways for this company to not only uh, engage their people um, and to create new business opportunities. But what we're really trying to do here is to create an ecosystem, a business ecosystem where people collaborate based, you know, based on those, those relationships. So for, it's really those, those, probably those, those two things, that idea that you can go in and create a tailored solution that really meets their real needs, the current needs of your client, but also at the same time, that second thing, which is that, that ability to, when you're working with someone, that you develop such, you develop so much more of a deep relationship and it takes the guesswork out of it as well. Mm -hmm. You said uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. How can we create that culture of collaboration when we have people from different countries, mm -hmm. people that, speak different languages for example my first language is spanish right mm -hmm. or maybe someone else that says japanese our cultures are different our perspectives are different i know you have lived in australia uh in germany in japan and now in mexico how do you create that that you know collaborative culture where you know people can be themselves and keep their culture but at the same time work together sure that's, and it's so important, and that's really so such so key to creating that ecosystem. So let's go. For, let's approach this from two sides. There's the soft skills kind of thing, and then there's the hard skills kind of thing. So let's begin from the soft skills. So the soft skills side is we live in a world where there is no clear answer to anything. No one really knows. There's the problems are getting more complex by the minute. Um, and what we need is we need a diverse set of people approaching problems. So the, the number one thing in order for us to build an ecosystem of collaboration is a respect that everybody can bring something to the table, right? And so if you're thinking secretly, right? Secretly deep down, you're like, I think I can solve this. And it, you, you know, it's kind of like those people in a group project that would be, you know, just you you guys let me do it and i'll do it and just you guys sign your names off on the end and that will be it you know it's only ever going to be one perspective so the number one thing in order to build a business ecosystem of collaboration is to actually begin within and for you to show up with i'm not only i'm not only interested in what my collab in what my ecosystem partners or my stakeholders have to say it's actually essential to solving this problem so that kind of mindset shift. The second thing, when you're talking about um, having different people um, and different cultures, I've seen not only across, I would say cross-cultural, cross-language collaboration, but even, um, you know, there's introverts and extroverts. And, you know, I would say that a, a Japanese lawyer and an American lawyer probably have more in common than a than a Jap you know than a Japanese than like a Japanese lawyer and a Japanese I don't know like a comedian you know so <laughs> so sometimes culture isn't always the thing that either connects you or separates you you know there's a lot so the a tactical point that I would encourage people to do is understand that conversation uh, is is not only something. See the thing is the conversation because it's because it's so natural and, mo and if it, if you, most people can speak, um, and even even if you can't speak, conversation is you know then with um, you know with sign language or whatever. Uh, the fact that most people can just have a conversation means that people think oh it's 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 easy. The same way with walking. You know I'm sure that if you know the reason why we probably have so many feet problems because people actually don't walk properly. You know it could but because it's easy or it's natural we don't review it. So I would think I'd take the same lens with communication, being if we're gonna have a, a collaborative session, we need to understand, I would begin with having divergent and convergent conversations. Okay, let's set expectations, let's diverge in this conversation and then converge. But while we're diverging, for example, I would, I would encourage you to find ways for everyone to participate. So one thing, particularly in Japan, if you're in a global company, um, 
the person that speaks English the best ends up being the person who speaks at all. And everyone's just like, just nods and just goes along with it, you know? But then even in, I'm sure it's happened even in your own cultures and it hasn't even had this global layer to it, just the person that's the loudest or is the most kind of boisterous or the most aggressive kind of tends to be the one to push their opinion. So what we try to do here is utilize that person's passion in a different way, right? And so a, a really simple step is that when you're in ideation or you're asking for feedback or you're asking for questions, instead of saying, raise your hand or posing it to the group and you say, does anyone have any questions? What you do is, is you say, okay, everyone, there's a pen and a paper, you know, and a post-it in front of you. Everyone write down your top three points or your top three questions or your top three whatever. And two, two really interesting things happen. One, you are never able to get as much output in like a three minute period than if you separate individual and group work. If, you, if we have three minutes, it's probably maximum two people could ask a question, right, max. But if we have three minutes, and we say, everyone write it down, all of a sudden, instead of having this one-to-one -one communication, we have one-to-end communication. Mm -hmm. Then you start to see what's the real temperature of the room. What are people really asking? So maybe the person that ha you know, is the loudest isn't necessarily representative of the group, right? Maybe the group is, you know, has more, has, you know, wants to ask more about question A, but the loudest person won't shut up about point B, you know, so stuff like that. So I would encourage to create this collaborative ecosystem to, not, to, to develop a mindset that you don't need to have all the, all the solutions. And we see this particularly kind of in Japan, this commitment to perfectionism, this commitment of, I can't go to my client if it's imperfect, right? This kind of mindset, but it's not about going to your client with you know, shoddy work. It's going to your client with, with, a, and with, a, with a prototype you know, for development. And, you know, what we've seen time and time again, especially in Japan, is when you, when you deliver something and it's kind of too perfect, right? The client won't give you feedback because they think, shogunai, 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 mo yatte kurete kara, mo shogunai. Like it's, you already did it, so I won't bother saying anything, you know? So what we want to do is we want to show the client that we're still interested in learning. We want their feedback. And this is very much on our side to think about how do we present our work, right? So we want to have that mindset, but we've got to think about how we present our work. And then very much in the, in the implementation side of things, uh, definitely have divergent and convergent conversations. And um, number two, write things down. Don't discuss it, write things down. And then we get, uh, we get everybody's voice. You know, we can capture everybody's voice. And this comes, this comes down to that, that seed of innovation. Why do we need everyone's voice? Because every single person in the logistics chain is an expert in their department, right? So we need everyone's input in order for us to build these robust solutions. Amazing. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> so Ridley, uh, let me ask you something. So, uh, you know, Japanese culture is very hierarchical. Very hierarchical. Yep. Um, let's say, you know, I have my own business mm -hmm. and I have my Japanese employees and I mm -hmm. want them to be a little more assertive, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit more confident, uh, saying their opinions, a little bit more comfortable working with me. Because, you know, in Latin America, like, we're loud, we're passionate, we're very straightforward, as, as you know, because you live in Mexico. Uh, how, how can I do that with my, uh, you know, working with Japanese uh, people? Yes. So, the, the, obviously, there's different approaches. There's different right. approaches. Um, not, but what I found to be uh, effective without massive cultural transformation without like a whole organizational transformational package, right? Which can take years. Um, the number one thing that I found is to, is to rethink or reframe roles and responsibilities, right? And so what that means is, let's say we're, at the, we're in a boardroom or we're in a workshop and we want different ideas. Rather than saying, okay, everyone, we're all equal right? We're all equal. 
me no naji everyone's the same this doesn't work because people are like well we're not really the same because you're super important or you're really not important or whatever what i found that's not effective we're all the same it's not effective what i found is you, we're all experts in our fields or in our role and we need you to speak up in that role so if I'm the CEO, I'm an expert in being the CEO of our company. So I'm going to, I'm going to give ideas from my position. But if you're like a Shin Yishain, like you're a new graduate to our company, then you have a different lens. So what we want you to do is show up as the Shin Yishain lens or the Shin Yishain voice so that everyone's represented it. So rather than saying we're all this one kind of beige person in our company, it's no, where these strong, different, like you're orange and I'm yellow and you're green and I, whatever, someone else is blue. So I found that this has been more effective in overcoming hierarchy and at the same time, leveraging individual contribution. Got it, got it. So to have that balance between exactly. hierarchy and their respect, but at the same time, people have their own individuality. Yeah, exactly. So you'll right. never find you'll never find this kind of okay. It's your so some one thing that I've seen is like you'll have like a foreign um uh, many like uh, the workshop facilitator, right? You have a foreign workshop facilitator, and they'll be like, okay, everyone, ever today's first names, right? Today's first names, and they're like Japanese people have never called their boss their first name in their entire life. You know what I mean? Like, right, and this right, right. totally freaks them out, right? Totally freaks them out. So what we've got to do is we've got to find ways that instead of saying we're all equal, is to, is to work, and you know, and this is so much the, mo the, the motto of how we run workshops, which is how do we respect those kind of guidelines of Japanese culture, but also leverage or take away the, the barriers to collaboration, right? Because as much as Japanese culture um, is, uh, you know, is, is very unique and it's a very beautiful culture in many ways, there are certain things about those wonderful things about Japanese culture, like ha harmony and things like that, that stop certain parts of, you know, business innovation. Like one thing about business innovation is we need to take risks. You know, we need to trial something. It has to be you know, it has, to, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. So th these kinds of things. Um, and sometimes these are, these are inconsistent with, with Japanese kind of values. And so what we want to do is find a way that we, we, we help our participants feel comfortable and feel safe, right? It's always about them feeling safe and feeling authentic. Like there's nothing less authentic than getting everyone in Japan to call them by their first names and they've never used it a day in their life. And tomorrow when they go back to the office, they're no longer, you know, you know, whatever, Hiroyuki, they're like back to Tanaka-san or whatever, you know what I mean? So it doesn't make any sense being like, just for these two hours, let's be friends, be friends, like, come on. What we're trying to do is create sustainable change or sustainable systems within Japan and kind of these taking, you know, and this is why when, when you introduced your, your, your values for, for the community, I, I really liked the fact that it was to find the balance, right? It's, you know, that we love Japan, um, you know, as, as a community, but at the same time, we understand that there's certain elements that maybe we need to tweak or there's elements about the Japanese culture that we need to understand in order to move forward. And getting, you know, and kind of circling back is as much as that kind of the nail that seeks out gets hammered down mentality, as much as that's very true, well, instead of taking the idea that everyone's the same because they're lower, let's take the idea that everyone's the same because they're higher, they're a higher position. So we elevate people to an expert role. Okay. And then also one thing that I found is when you, when you allocate responsibility in Japan, they're, they're very serious about it. You know, so when I say, I need you to think as the new graduate in the company, they'll take that very seriously and they will do that. They will do that role. Um, and so, you know, and, and this way we overcome hierarchy and also what I'm so passionate about, which is how do we leverage individual voices in Japanese companies instead of just, pushing them to the side but it's also okay. in a way that they're comfortable as well you know right definitely i like how you brought individuality 
And something that we talked in our brainstorming session is the practical, how would you say, uh, the practical benefit of being yourself in a company. Um, so, you know, we know that Japan is, you know, a very hierarchical uh, country, especially in business. Uh, and being yourself, it's something that's, you know, it, it's not as, accept, as accepted as in America. I remember when I was working for uh, a Japanese company, uh, one of the things they told me is, why do you smile so much? <laughs> or, like, or like, why do you stand up so straight? Or why is your eye contact so good? You understand? Mm -hmm. Which was very like bizarre for me, but it is what it is. Uh, how can I use that, like being myself, mm -hmm. to keep my essence mm -hmm. as, as a practical benefit to, you know, mm -hmm. to improve the company, to bring value to the company? Sure. And maybe if we take like a foreign lens base and one of the reasons why you are working with your client or you're working with the, you're working in this company is because of your ability to contribute right so and one thing that i've also found is that there's a level of misunderstanding about japan just wants you to shut up as a foreigner mm -hmm. i haven't found that to be the case what i have found to be the case is your role is to not go in and say, okay, guys, that's one culture. Let me tell you about my culture. And then let's change to that, right? And because that's kind of where I found a little bit there's a conflict. That people will come in and say, okay, Japan, your hierarchy, it's a bad idea. Get rid of it. Let's change to what we do, you know? Yeah, but at the same time in the U.S., you have the highest un unemployment rate ever because everyone gets fired. Like, it's just a different system. So mm -hmm. you can't say... You know, the reason why, uh, like, the hierarchy exists in a Japanese company, you can't look at that as an isolated thing. You know, there's so much behind it. Like, the fact that there's also benefits to a hierarchy, that Japanese companies take their responsibility of their people very seriously. So you don't just end up with no job tomorrow, you know? So this is a good thing. So, you know, there, there's, it's not only good things or bad things. What I would encourage in order for you to, to feel authentically you in Japan and for you to work at a Japanese company... Um, is to understand that your role is to contribute, not to change, right? So you're contributing. Because what we've often seen is Japanese management is terrible. Western management is good. Ja Western management is bad. Japanese management is good, right? This is, and if we look at this call, you'll see that this dialogue around management, particularly around Japan and abroad, is outdated, it's super outdated. It's super like 1980s. We've just had the bubble period. People are still have corporate credit cards and they're going to Kabukicho with their bosses. Like this is, this doesn't, this is not Japan anymore. Like we've moved on. So the modern dialogue around being a foreigner or even just being like a, I would even just say like a strong Japanese personality in a Japanese company is to not take the responsibility of change, but to contribute. So the way that we do that is that we want, you know, firstly, it's a mindset shift that we don't, because people often see something that they want to, they, that they don't like, or that's reflected or that's different to them. And they go, you're making me change. No, you change. And you're like, hang on a second. Isn't this the same problem, but just from like a different, from a different angle. Um, and so what I would encourage um, foreigners to do in Japan is instead of having this kind of A, B mentality to create this plus culture, which is, okay, what is great about the current culture of this organization and what can I do to leverage or what can I do to make it better in, in certain areas without kind of this, um, you know, finite mentality of it's us or them or A and B. And so I haven't, as much as there is a lot of, like I, I remember a time, and this is like a very simple example, but I don't drink tea. I'm a coffee person. I've always been a coffee person. Like I'll drink tea. The only reason I drink tea is if I've already drunk too much coffee that day and I can't have any more coffee because I'll be sick. It's the only reason I'll drink tea. We're at a client meeting. There's probably eight people in the room. And this was the question. You know, someone came in and said, you know, like, would you like a drink? And this was the conversation. Ocha. So ocha means tea. Ocha. Ocha. 
ocha, 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 ocha. And then I was like, I really want to say coffee. But I didn't. I said, ocha, otashi mo ocha kudasai. Like I said, ocha, because I thought of the other person. I was like, well, this person has to make seven teas and one coffee, or maybe she can just make like a pot of, co of tea and I'll just drink tea. I'm not going to die if I drink tea, you know what I mean? And so I think it's that idea of have moments that you're like, no, this is a non-negotiable for me, right? Which is, for example, performance achievement. Go to your Japanese boss and say, I want performance achievement. I want you to tell me what I'm doing good and tell me what I'm not, where I can improve. But if it's stuff like coffee or tea, just drink the tea. You know, it's right. not, it's not worth it. So I would say in the points of individuality, go inside yourself and be like, where am I going to push? And if it's something like tea, just drink the tea. Right. So basically pick your battles, right? Pick your battles. Absolutely pick your battles. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love how you talk about keeping the balance between your culture and Japanese culture. That's definitely something that you can use. Um, I want to go back to the beginning. You talk about resilience. And I think uh, nowadays, a lot of people lack resilience. Because the world is too, especially Japan, the United States, even now, it's, they're, they're safe countries. Like, how do we develop resilience uh -huh. in, in, so in our daily lives? So we're getting a lesson right now. It's called COVID-19. And whether you wanted to learn to be resilient or not, Mother Nature is, you know, reminding you that this is, this is a way to be resilient. Um, the, the, one, the one thing about resilience, and this is actually where you can really use a Japanese mindset. If mm -hmm. you ask me, I understand what you're talking about, that, you know, the Japan is safe and sometimes you don't have to step out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But the key to resilience is to take the long view right? There's, there's no need for you to be super resilient one week and then the next week you kind mm -hmm. of fall in a heap. So this is where I would encourage you to look around at, you know, Japan and see that as much as, you know, there's, there's things that we could change, um, that 51% of companies that are over 100 years old are Japanese companies, mm -hmm. right? Which means that are they the, the high, you know, are they those huge trillion dollar companies? Are they the biggest companies? No, but they're in it for the long run, right? So I think in order to build resilience, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? What, what are you trying to do, right? In general, are you there to, to support culture change? Are you there to contribute to a new way of thinking? What are you there to do? And if, you're, if your goal is going to take you more than one interaction, which I hope it does, you know, I hope that we all find these, these things that are our life's work, you know, um, you're going to need that ability to stay in the game, right? And the ability to stay in the game means you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. You know, there are some days that, you know, because we're currently uh, in, in Mexico through, due to travel restrictions, but our home still very much is in Japan. So when I'm walking around Minato Mirai and I'm like, this is my dream. This is the most beautiful experience I've ever had. And then there's other times where I'm like, I, why did I choose to open a business in this country? <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, and then something will happen and I'll say, no, I know why. And, you know, so I will, in order to build that resilience, I would find something that you're really passionate about. And I know some people, you know, it takes time, right? Which means that, you know, you have to try different things. But I found passion um, comes easily to me when I have passion for the people. You know, when I have passion for the people I'm working with. So maybe it's the team, maybe it's the community. And I'm, I really, yeah, so I found that if, if you can't find passion necessarily in a, in a task, in a thing, um, if you can find passion in people or in your clients, um, that really helps the resilience. And this is something where, of course, you know, in the US or, you know, in Western societies, you have this go fight mentality. But in Japan, you actually have this idea of like, gamma, isho ni gamarimashō, like this idea, let's do it together. Right. And resilience, because we're talking about resilience, takes the long view. Sometimes that Japanese mentality of instead of going in and 
you know, that kind of cowboy mentality and changing everything, that, that mentality of let's do this together, let's do it together, this idea, sometimes that's even more sustainable and that helps you be resilient because on those days that you have bad days, because everyone's going to have bad days, you can look to the person to the left and to the right of you and you say, I can't do it today. You know, I can't do it today. So I, w- I would encourage, yeah, th- th- those things. Find passion in people if you can't find it in a task. Um, and then also, you know, leverage everyone here being kind of bicultural people. Leverage those things in you. Like Angel with you, you know, you have your like Latin American kind of like passion and fire. But at the same time, you also have like your ability to, to read a room like from Japan. And this is where you as a bicultural person are so much more equipped to be resilient because you have a you, you have a larger toolbox, you know, and it's the same way that if you're just a Jap- if you're you know a monocultural Japanese person, um, maybe you don't have that kind of you know you want to stand up and say what you, you think, you know. But at the same time, if you're a monocultural Western person, maybe you don't have the respect for your environment, right? So, us here on the call, um, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting a few people on the call. Um, that ability that you know having that that bicultural sometimes tricultural perspective just puts you in in such a better position to be able to weather the weather the storm beautiful beautiful the last question i want to ask you how do you adapt to germany to japan to mexico because you're so different how how do you adapt <laughs> yeah um so the thing is, I will never know how to be Japanese, right? Because I, I, it's something that you can ne- you can't really learn it, right? There's you can't you can't look, you can't really learn it. Same way that I can never learn to be German. So one of the things that um, that I that I've done is instead of looking at that kind of idea of who what's this culture. I kind of take the, the the design thinking view, which is what is the people? What can I learn here? What can I contribute? And so for me, it's more, it's it's less of like, of course there's stuff like in Japan, like take your meishi and bow and you know, there's, there's those things. Um, but I think the number one thing in terms of cultural, the ability to build bridges in culture um, is less, I would say in the logistics, like do this, don't do that. In Germany, people are, you know, people are rude. No, they're not. They're just direct, like whatever. If you show up as a, as a curious person, as a learning person, if you acknowledge and you say, I know I'm different, but I'm here to learn, you know, and I'm here to share rather than here to change, you know, which is why, you know, we've seen not only in a cultural sense, but also in a business sense, in a management sense, if you have like these, change management professionals who come in change everything and leave that you're like i don't you know they're less effective than if the change comes from within the organization and i would say that's still very that's that's very true to to adapting to culture is don't worry about trying to get the culture perfect you're never going to get the culture perfect because you're not that culture it's not gonna happen but what you can do in order to make your life a little bit easier, in order for you to build those meaningful relationships, is that you can go in and you can say things like, I'm here to learn, or, uh, you know, this was different. And so, for example, I saw a, a question on the question, which was, you know, what do you do when you're trying to be yourself, or, you, you know, but it's, it's, it comes across poorly, or it comes across, comes across rude. So I think as, if, you're, if you're coming with a learning perspective, if you're coming with a learning mindset, if you're coming with a sharing mindset, um, I think people will, will, will pick up on that. I think it's different, like a, a very simple example. And I, I, I almost cringed to, to use it because we have so many v- very experienced and educated people on the call is for example, even when we greet each other in Japan, like Japanese people don't bow, they don't hug. They bow, right? And so I've seen I've seen people come into Japan and say stuff like, "In my country, we hug, so I'm gonna hug you." And I'm like, mm. Mm. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know. So that's for me like one of those things where it's like, what we want to do is we want to find a way for you to be you, and but also that it doesn't affect kind of others. And the way to do that 
is to just have that learning mindset, that curious mindset and that sharing mindset. Um, I think when people go in and this is, I have to be honest, this is probably my, my benefit of being Australian. Um, I found if you're from like a, like an alpha culture, like I eat the States or something like that, like these kind of G8, if you're in the G8, if your country is in the G8, I'm my, my opinion is kind of like an alpha culture, which means like it's a global culture. Like people don't know anything about Australia. So what I'm, so for example, what that means is if you're from these kind of alpha cultures, meaning that it's a, it's a very strong culture. Sometimes you, you grew up thinking it's right. Should mm -hmm. be like, Whereas in like Australia, we're not in the GA and we're always kind of at a kid's table when it comes to like, you know, global conversations that we, we never really grew up with the idea that the Australian way is the right way. But I do know that there's some cultures that grow up with this idea. And, you know, when you do share culture as well, like, for example, Japan is a very unique culture as well. Um, you know, it's not really, of course, there's elements of, you know, um, groupism and things like that throughout Asia. But there are, you know, there are very, you know, certain specifics um, to Japan that you don't see in other areas. So I would just say, don't try to be, be perfect. That's never going to happen. Um, you're better investing your time in building relationships um, and doing that like with an open mind or with a learning mindset is very much um, a part, a part of that. I love it. I love it. Uh, Brittany, two questions real quick. Uh, the last two questions before our Q and A session. Number one, the change you want to see in the world. I would, I would love if we began with the problem rather than the solution. And if we took that empathetic mindset of instead of trying to fix people or whatever, if we just tried to understand first. If it's, it's everything from super. We can take, let's take a very unemotional topic like Hanko. Right? If we, Hanko, which is the Japanese, you know, stamp. So there, imagine people are saying, get rid of it, it's stupid, without having any conversation about why does it exist? And if we get rid of it, who's going to be affected? And how can we help people implement this change? So I would love to see that if, if we began with a deeper commitment to understanding the person, and their and their ecosystem and their and their environment first before we start just throwing kind of cookie cutter solutions at people that are are useless once we leave. Exactly, empathy. I love it. Your song. Yeah. So my I have a funny song actually. So in my non kind of like business Japanese life, I'm involved in an organization called Rotary International. So I don't know if anyone's heard of Rotary International. It's a service organization, do like community service work. And, and two years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, MC their, or um, our international convention in Toronto. And there were, it was in front of 25,000 people. And so I was the one lead, leading it. And I, I was able to choose my walk on song. Like, you know, the song when you walk yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And my walk on song was um, Viva La Vida by Coldplay, right? So it's like, dun, 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 you know, and I liked it because, you know, I'm walking into, on stage in front of 25,000 people. It's kind of like modern, it's got like a modern twist, but also it has kind of like that classic twist as well. And so I was like, I think that's, that's going to be my song. And then during practice, I walk out and in the, in the Air Canada Stadium, and um, Living La Vida Loca by Ricky Martin is playing. Whoa. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm just going on. And then I know it's there, and, and it, luckily at this point, uh, the stadium was empty. And I said, um, this song is just a placeholder, right? And they're like, no, this was your song. And I said, no, my song is not Living La Vida Loca by Ricky Martin. It's Viva La Vida by Coldplay. And I was like, I'm so glad I said something. Otherwise, I would have walked out on stage in front of 25,000 people to Ricky Martin, Living La Vida Loca. There's nothing wrong with that song, but it's not my song. You know? It's different. <laughs> it's completely different. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was beautiful. Uh, before we go to our Q&A session, uh, I wanted to thank you 
for coming to the show and providing your super valuable uh, insights regarding culture and business. Uh, I know you live in Mexico. It's like 4 a.m. right now, like at the moment, right? 6. 6 a.m.? So thank you so much for taking the time to, you know, provide that insight. And do you have any last message before the Q&A session? No, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, when we have these interactions for that not to be the end of the conversation rather than it be the beginning. Um, but I, I would just like to thank everyone yeah, for, for their time and Angel also to you. I think that this is so important uh, to modernize the, the dialogue and to humanize the dialogue around entrepreneurship uh, in Japan. Um, and what I particularly enjoy um, about these kinds of new conversations is that it's not a purely Western view and it's not a purely Japanese view. It's this idea that we come together and we collaborate. And I think we're able to do that for a few reasons, but I also think we're finally at a time where young, like professionals in Japan have a level of Japanese fluency. Whereas, you know, I would say in the 80s, if you were a foreign manager in Japan, no one spoke a word of Japanese. You know, everyone was just here on some kind of like global finance company contract and they were here five years and then went home. I think there's a, there's a new face of international talent in Japan and it's, And it looks like you, you know, which is, you know, you're trilingual, actually, you know, you speak not only English and Japanese, um, but also Spanish. So it's the idea that we can come um, and we can contribute uh, to Japan, but also from, from, you know, that base of empathy that we've been talking about today, which is very much, um, you know, but in, and empathy drives innovation, it drives business development. Um, and it also drives, you know, happier, healthier societies. So I would just like to also thank you and encourage you uh, to keep going on your journey and to keep, you know, having these conversations um, and to keep unmasking uh, and bringing light and showcasing these kinds of uh, stories in Japan. And I hope that uh, this is really the beginning of a new, a new, yeah, a new business conversation in Japan. Definitely. And where can people contact you, find you? Where so, So re re really most places, they all come to me at the end. So it, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so you search my name um, and I c come up pretty high at the top. Uh, you can also find us, uh, our, if you want to know more about our business at um, designthinkingjapan.com. Uh, and we're also on Instagram, both. Yeah, so I, I personally am an old tech company. Um, and so, yeah, you can find me. And we also have a, we also have a, a podcast which is similar to yours, leading, you know, modernizing conversations around business in Japan, which is the business karaoke podcast. So there's, we're, we're there. So just search Google and I'll, I'll come up somewhere. Sounds beautiful. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, we're going to go to our Q&A session. I'm going to give you a minute and a half, two minutes, so that you can think about your questions and just type them down. And then after that, we're going to go by order. And if you want to uh, ask your question personally to Brittany, that's okay. If you don't want to, that's fine too. All right. Please type your questions. Thirty seconds. Fifteen. Three, two, one. All righty. Let's start with Miho. Miho, would you like to ask uh, Brittany your question? Hi, Brittany. Hi, Miho. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know you were in Mexico now. <laughs> I'm a man. It's corona induced, so it's, it's only we're waiting for the travel ban to lift and then we'll, we, yeah. we'll be back. 
please come back. <laughs> so my question is like, I know you're organizing tons of workshops for Japanese corporations. You know, what was the biggest change that you could make for the like culture or organization? It was like, was it empathy or something else? Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of me saying what I think it was, maybe I'll tell you the most common feedback that we get. Maybe that's interesting. So at the end of a workshop, we do kind of like a 360 view where we ask everyone, you know, what they like, what they didn't like, what they would change. And consistently, the thing that our Japanese participants say that they liked is that they like the structured group work, that people could speak up, that, you know, in, when we were in convergence, we, you know, people weren't saying, like, we didn't have these kinds of issues. So without a doubt, a more structured way to engage individual opinion because people often think Japanese people don't like sharing their opinion for me this is wrong this is not right this is too narrow if they don't like sharing their opinion in an environment where it might negatively affect somebody else that's the case and so we what we do through our design thinking uh, structure is that we encourage a way for everyone to speak up in a way that's safe for them and also kind of harmonic for the room. So that's probably the number one thing. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Miho, thank you so much. Let's go to Jason. Jason. Hey, how are you going? Thanks very much, guys. Uh, Brittany, just a realization I had that uh, the whole theme of this um, webinar and and, this, and, and your business is innovation, and that that might consciously or unconsciously be um, perceived by Japanese, um, whether they're in a foreign or a domestic firm, as, as change, immediate change, and the threat of change and risk, mm -hmm. whether they're consciously thinking or, or not. So uh, in a nutshell, how would, you, how would you handle that as someone who wants to introduce innovation, knowing it going in before you open your mouth? What, what would you uh, lead with to try and just dispel that or get people to put that aside? Thank you, Jason. That's such an, an important question um, because it really is the basis of those initial conversations that we have with clients. So if we think about the, the word innovation in Japanese, right, it's innovation, which means it's katakana. So anything katakana means it's an English-derived word, which means it doesn't you know, naturally come from the Japanese language. So any katakana word you have a certain level of, I would say, like nemawashi required or kind of, you know, lo lobbyism in a way, like required, mm. you know, and so this is kind of step one. <clears throat> the, how, and so once we kind of have this in mind that, it, that the word innovation brings up, as you said, and think about the innovation, the word innovation, how many misconceptions there are even in English. And then think about that in a Japanese setting and it means something different to everybody, right? So your, your connection between innovation and risk and change is 100% spot on. So the way that we manage this is rather than kind of having innovation as this, um, this finite process that you, know, you get right or wrong, what we try to do is we draw a, a, a comparison to something that's already very true to or very close to the Japanese culture. So and, and in, in an innovation workshop, what we do is for two hours or for half a day or a day or however long it is, we go in and we do crazy ideas and, you know, anything goes and we can have fun and we can talk to anyone. Uh, and then when the day's over, you know, we can decide, do we move forward or not? And so what we try to do is we, if you think about a, a time where Japanese people can go somewhere for two hours or half a day and be crazy and talk to anyone, it's like karaoke, right? If you think about like karaoke, that's really what uh, like a karaoke experience is. And if we think about the Japanese karaoke experience is so essential to the, to, you know, to, to binding relationships in Japan, it's essential to even just day-to-day -day business. So what we try to do is say that innovation is not about that at the end of the day, we have the right answer, we have the wrong answer, and we have to implement all of it or not. What we try to do is, is we say that innovation is an opportunity for exploration, right? It's an opportunity for exploration. And if we think about who's leading innovation, right? So if we go back to what we've been saying all, all along, which is let's take a step back, let's think about the, the 
the problem or let's think about the person. If you think about who's responsible for innovation, right? It's probably usually a Japanese manager who is either in their late 50s, um, who is who's signing off on like one of these big projects, right? So if we think about the in Japanese organizations, so obviously in foreign organizations, it's a little different, but let's take a traditional Japanese lens on this. So it's a, it's a manager who's like in their mid fifties and this could be their legacy project, right? They've worked at this company for 30 years and this could be their legacy project. They're sitting in front of an opportunity. Do we change? Do we do this? Do we not? And they're, and they're maybe only like five years from retirement as well, right? So we think about they're like, you know, five years from retirement. What we're looking at is we're looking at someone who is taking a risk, not only on a project, but on their reputation in the company right? They're thinking, I'm actually responsible. This, this could be my last project in the company and maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work, right? So we need to have a level of empathy for that. This American, sorry, I don't mean to say American, but this kind of like Western idea of, you know, fail fast, go in, like whatever. Imagine saying to someone who's worked at a company for 30 years, whose reputation is defined by this next project, fail fast, whatever. It's not, it's not going to work. It's not, it's not appropriate for that person. It's not appropriate. It's not empathetic. So I'm laughing on mute. You're laughing on mute. I'm so glad. Um, so the, the number one thing that I would encourage when it comes to innovation in Japan, the way that we lead conversations is that innovation is a, is a chance to explore rather than this thing you get right or wrong. So this is for me the probably the biggest change. Otherwise, you know, and you've just said it exactly. You know, risk mean you know risk is uncertain. We don't know. Do we get you know? And even if we think about the the investment, the financial investment required for innovation, what we try to do is we work in short sprints. So rather than saying, okay, we need how many you know hundred million yen in order to roll out this project over the next three years, what we try to do is is we break it up almost like it's, it's like reading a book. You read chapter one and then you go to chapter two, then you do chapter three, you know, and that's kind of what it's like. So what we try to do is say, okay, we want to get to the end of chapter one. And then what we try to do is provide value in the way that we can as fast as possible so that we secure our funding for the next phase. So instead of the company having to go in and find, you know, extra, you know, cash that they, they haven't had. And one of the reasons that they need innovation is because they don't have extra cash. So what we're trying to do is create a, create a model that innovation can actually finance itself within the organization. So that's really key. Um, but also definitely just probably that mindset shift of innovation isn't like a linear process, like we start here and we end here, rather that it's cyclic and it's an opportunity to learn and explore in like a, in a quicker way rather than this kind of like, you know, ro you know, three year rollout kind of model. So yeah, such an important conversation, Jason, super important. Thank you so much. I don't, does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a head start. It's, it's where to begin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Jason. Let's go to Anthony. Anthony, would you like to ask uh, Brittany your question directly? Sure. Um, Thanks again. Wonderful presentation and great to talk to you again. Um, I just wanted to know, you know, what inspired you to start your business in the first place? You know, um, this type of business and in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your question, Anthony. I think like all of us in Japan, sometimes like it, it wasn't like you wake up one day and you're like, I'm going to do this. Like it wasn't really kind of exactly like that. Um, but there was an opportunity when I was so I originally I learned design thinking at the D school in Germany so there's two D schools one is in Stanford in the states and the other one is at the HPI in Germany and I went to the one in Germany and um, when I started learning about the methodology behind design thinking immediately I thought this is really translatable for Japan like the divergent convergent conversations the everybody has a voice the instead of that everything is like verbally communicated that we can use a lot of writing this I was like this could really be something meaningful for Japan so that those seeds were there already and then in 2017 I had an opportunity to go and lead uh, some workshops and it was during that time that I saw that it it really became you know that was where my 
that minimal, you know, viable product that I would, that it really was tested. <laughs> this could really be, this could really launch in Japan. Um, and another thing is, is that design thinking and innovation, there's a lot of content already in English, um, particularly, um, you know, that derives from the States or even, you know, when I was in Germany, like the Germans have a different approach to innovation, which is probably more consistent with Japanese than it probably is with the American model of innovation. Um, this idea of build the perfect product and just refine the process, whereas the Americans have a, like a little bit of a different view. So, um, and then I saw, actually, if I don't stand up and say something, if I don't lead the conversation around design thinking in Japan, who will? Who will? Because I don't really know a whole lot of people who speak Japanese and English who can bridge both cultures. Like, obviously, you know, we, and we're now building like a, like a Japanese community that like native Japanese um, to, to foreign. But I think equally important is that we need kind of like foreign native to Japanese. And I thought this is, this is, got, this is more impactful. Like, of course, you know, could we open a, an innovation agency in, you know, in, in the States or in Europe? The answer is yes. But as much as Japan has, you know, um, high red tape, and if you need to navigate high red tape, then I recommend everyone can call uh, Miho because she, uh, Miho Tanaka from Japan because she's an incredible resource. Um, but I, that's when I started thinking, once we navigate the red tape, behind that could really be opportunity for impact, opportunity for change. And so that for me was why I thought, okay, let's stick with Japan. Um, because firstly, I had a proven business case. So I think I, I would encourage anyone, if you're going to start a business in Japan, I would encourage you to test your business before you launch, because, you know, we're, we were talking about resilience. We're talking about that. Uh, if you don't, if you don't believe it can happen because you haven't tested it, or if you don't know, if you're unsure if it can happen, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to navigate the waters uh, of Japan, which are sometimes very, very tough, really. Um, so that was number one. But then I really saw once you manage the paperwork in Japan, once that's done, there's really an opportunity for impact. There's really an opportunity to change. There's really an opportunity to affect people's lives much more than if I was in the States. Like you can call 10,000 other people who do what I do in the States. You can call 10,000 other people who do what I do. 20,000, 50,000, 100,000. I don't know how many, but like many other people. But if in Japan, I thought I would love to be a part of that, that, or that first wave of people who are, you know, because we've seen in Japan, those conversations exist, conversations around um, business development and conversations around um, yeah, like workplace reform, right? So we've had these conversations in Japan, but really what's behind those two things? Innovation, what's behind that? People, empathy, the ability to, you know, to lead those conversations. So I started thinking, of course, I, I'm like the, 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 I have the usual answer, which I like, I love Japan. I love living in Japan. I love, like, I love it. it. Drives me crazy, but I still love it. You know, I love it. So that's, that's all true. But beyond that, right, beyond that, the thing that keeps me resilient, the thing that keeps me showing up, the thing that keeps me in Japan is definitely that, that view of um, the opportunity for impact. And I think a lot of people kind of shut up shop before they, or too early. Um, and, even, and I just, I've just seen so many businesses that if they just held in on just a little longer, if they got past the red tape, if they did the right paperwork, if they, you know, set themselves up properly, that their business could really impact Japan, could really affect Japan in a positive way. Um, but for some reason they, you know, for, for personal reasons and different reasons, people, you know, had to leave early. Uh, so for me, yeah, definitely that, that the opportunity for impact. Awesome. Thank you. All right, perfect. Uh, any other questions? Anyone? Anyways, uh, guys, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm extremely grateful that you guys, you know, took the time to join us and talk to us and ask those amazing questions. Uh, before we finish our session, I want to announce that next Friday, July 3rd, at 7 p.m., we're going to have Volume 5. And actually, the guest speaker for Volume 5 is right here. Mijo? <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> Mijo, can you please uh, tell us something? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> Quick message, something. Okay. Yeah, like I always talk about paperwork and visa and incorporation for all the events. But this time, uh, because Angel suggested, we will talk about, like, like we will talk more about like how, like why I started it my own. It's my like how I personally felt. And yeah, it's not only about technical thing, but yeah, the other things as well. So also if you have any like opinions, what kind of topics you wanna hear, please let me know. Thank you. All right, Miho, thank you so much. Yeah, so basically we are gonna talk about starting your business in Japan, like the startup scene. But at the same time, we're gonna talk about the self uh, development part that goes with starting your business. Like how can you improve yourself and get to that mental state so that you can start up your business and then help society. Awesome, and that's it for today. Thank you guys for joining and we'll see you next week, same time, same Zoom meeting. And that's it guys, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone, uh, go, go over to LinkedIn and uh, please connect with me. I'd love to connect with you. So thank you so much for having me, Anha. It was lovely. My pleasure. Yes, thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Bye, guys.